You're listening to the Bethel Community Church Podcast. Our podcast normally showcases our weekly sermons here in Chicago at 7601 West Foster. Now, podcasts are great, but they do not replace the care and community you receive from the local church or from your local pastor. So we encourage you to come, join our community, or contact us to help you find a community in your area. We pray the Lord speaks to you as you listen. Enjoy. In 2014, a then 24-year-old man from West Virginia was driving at night on State 2025, State Route 2025 in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. And as the man went to cross the Susquehanna River, he came to realize there was no bridge over the Susquehanna River. And he drove his truck right into the river. Now, thankfully, he was able to get out and swim to safety, and the uh, residents of the area were able to call the authorities. Well, when the authorities arrived, they asked the man what happened. And he told them, the GPS told him that he could go across the river this way. What may be strangest about that is there was never a bridge there. But maybe even stranger is that some months earlier, another man had tried to cross the river the same way. But thankfully, it was January, and the river was frozen over, so the man was able to drive across without incident. But again, he blamed his GPS. You know, we are all on a path in this life. We are all going somewhere. The question is, are the directions that we are following, is the guidance that we receive leading us on the path of life or leading us straight into the river? I mean, how many people think that they are following the way to life, the the path that will bring them joy, but in the end, it will only lead them straight into the river. And there are only two paths in life, make no mistake. Either you are on the path of wisdom and life, or you are on the path of folly and death. Through God's wisdom, you can experience abundant life and joy and eternal life in God, in relationship with God. God's wisdom shows us how we are to live life each step of this journey. And as we look at Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and I'd invite you to turn there, using the Bible provided, it's page 527, but as we Look, at the book of Proverbs, God gives us wisdom for life. So look with me at the first seven verses of the book of Proverbs. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, To receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise in their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. My call to you from these seven verses this morning is simply, fear the Lord to receive and grow in wise living. Fear the Lord. That is the only way to truly receive wisdom and the only way to truly grow in, to increase in wisdom for life. Now, there are a number of people who 
with the book of Proverbs. We'll take a proverb a day, one chapter of Proverbs. They'll start reading it. And certainly, if you aren't currently reading the Bible, I would actually encourage you to do this as we start this new series. Or if you're just saying, you know what, I need something new in my Bible reading time, take up the book of Proverbs. It's the beginning of the month. There's 31 chapters. You can read through Proverbs. Most months, you'll uh, be able to do one proverb uh, a day, and you'll be able to be done uh, by the end of the month, but even you know, like this month, you'll have to read two chapters at some point. That's a great practice because you see, Proverbs is like a feast in wise living. And Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, is the door into that feast, into that banquet of wisdom. And so, just like Psalms 1 and 2 are not just an introduction, but they're the the gateway, the door to understand the rest of the psalm. So it is, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, these seven verses are the doorway to this feast that Proverbs gives us of wisdom. You cannot skip these seven verses. You cannot miss what's said in these seven verses and expect to understand the rest of Proverbs. In fact, if you try to, you'll miss it. Because what is here is prerequisite. It's essential. So we start in verse 1 here, in which we see some preliminaries. Notice we read these are the Proverbs of Solomon. Well, that ought to cause us to pause and to ask, well, how do you read Proverbs. How can you understand Proverbs? When we think of Proverbs, you know, we think of regularly in English, we use that word proverb to describe a short, pithy, really generalized statement, either observing life or giving us some advice. So you have a, a stitch in time saves nine. Or many hands make light work. Or a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Those are simple English proverbs. And as we think of proverbs like that, normally when we think of proverbs in the Bible, we think of what we read in chapters 10 through 29. But what we read in chapters 1 through 9 and in chapters 30 and 31 are likewise proverbs. That Hebrew word that's translated proverb literally would translate as a comparison. And yet, proverbs can refer to more than what we would just consider a a comparison. Rather, there are other methods of teaching, such as pronouncements or observations of life as we read through the book of Proverbs. And so the Hebrew word is actually broader than what we think of in English, or what the English word means. And so we need to understand this genre of Proverbs because so often when we read Proverbs, Christians will make mistakes in understanding and applying Proverbs. And even if they're well-intentioned, will then use Proverbs in a way that actually harms themselves or others. So take, for example, Proverbs 22, verse 6. It's a proverb, not a promise. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, some people will tell Christians, hey, claim the promise of Proverbs 22.6 over your children. Then what ends up happening if a child walks away from the Lord or ends up just living in a way that makes a mess of their lives? I knew a man in Kenosha whose two sons had really walked away from God. And the man refused to confront his two sons for the way that they were living. Instead, he passively quoted Proverbs 22, 6 to himself. And he said, hey, I raised my children in the way that they should go. Someday God's going to bring them back. Well, others actually take the opposite approach thinking that this is a promise. I've seen good Christian parents have, you know, one of their children walk away from 
Christ. And what they end up doing is beating themselves up. Just thinking to themselves, where did I go wrong? What happened? What did I do or what didn't I do that caused my child to go away from the Lord? I've even seen Christians berate other Christians using a a verse like this and and say, well, your children have walked away because you failed in some way. And they end up being like Job's friends who think, well, God normally works in this way. This is the way of wisdom And since this is what happened, Job, you must have sinned for God to be treating you this way. And they treat other Christians like Job's friends. What went wrong? We failed to read Proverbs as Proverbs and read them like we might read the law or like we may read prophecy. We have to understand Proverbs correctly. What Proverbs 22, 6 is teaching is that all things being equal, if you raise your children in God's ways, usually they will follow the Lord, but not always. There is no guarantee of that. It's in God's hands. And so we have to read Proverbs as just that, as a proverb. But we also need to read them within their historical and biblical context. See, Proverbs aren't like Chinese Proverbs. They're not like those little sayings and fortune cookies. And I've got to admit, when I go to a Chinese restaurant, I like to get that fortune cookie. I I don't know why. I like the taste of them. But you just take the thing out of the package, you break it apart, you you, you eat it, and then you get that little saying in it. And it's very generalized, right? It's meant to be for all people in all places at all times. And, and, you know, they're so generalized that anybody could read it. It, it, Usually it's not even giving you advice or something. Half the time it's like trying to build up your self-esteem or something. But sometimes people will read the biblical Proverbs that way. But that's not how they work. No, as we read in chapter 1, verse 1, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. That sets the context here. These are meant for God's people in covenant relationship with God. Those who are the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who believe in the God who through Moses, delivered the Torah to his people, the God who delivered his people and brought them into the land, and the God who raised up David and his lineage to be the chosen kings. We know from 1 Kings 4, verse 32, that Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs. That's more than we will find in the book. He collected Proverbs. What that means is you shouldn't be surprised that there are a lot of similarities between biblical Proverbs and other ancient wisdom literature. So for instance, there's a lot of similarities with the Egyptian instruction of Amenemope. Try to say that three times fast. So Solomon may have borrowed and collected these Proverbs. but When he brings them into Scripture, they are thus God-breathed Scripture given to us as God's people to understand in light of our relationship with God. And so this is the necessary and this is the only basis For the wisdom of Proverbs, it is found in covenant relationship with God. You cannot have God's wisdom without having God. You cannot have the abundant life that God gives without having the God who gives it. And so as you come to the book of Proverbs, it's important to always ask yourself the question, are you reading Proverbs correctly? Are you reading it according to its genre as a proverb? And are you reading it in this biblical context? You know, we 
today need the wisdom of Proverbs. The laws are given, rules are given, but they can't cover all of life. You're going to find that there are gray areas. You're going to find times in your life that sometimes it's not a choice between what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes it's a choice between various options and you need to choose the one that is best or at least better than the others. In those times, you aren't going to be able to say, well, here's a rule to follow. Instead, you need to learn the way of wisdom. So Proverbs is really a gem for us today, especially within our cultural climate. In a, within an election year, certainly Proverbs can help us to know how to vote. Likewise, Proverbs gives us wisdom that goes beyond just that. It gives us wisdom to know how to live no matter who ends up winning the election in November. No matter who's in office, we can still live God's way in God's world. Wisdom reminds us that we are to live in the fear of the Lord moment by moment in all of life, hoping not in our politicians, hoping not in what we see around us, but putting our hope in God. Because we are God's covenant people. And so Proverbs teaches us how to live day by day. So with the preliminaries in mind, Solomon gives us really four purposes to Proverbs, four goals, you might say. And listen, if you want to enjoy life as God intends for you to live it, the book of Proverbs is for you. Notice the first purpose. It's in verses 2 and 3. It's for you to live wisely in God's world. Why did Solomon write? So that you would know wisdom and instruction. To understand words of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equity. We live in a, a day that so often people are, are thoughtless and mindless. And just going about life. But Proverbs engages our mind. Proverbs calls us to be thinking people. And indeed, Proverbs, the wisdom of God, renews our minds so that we can think and live God's way in God's world. And yet, Proverbs isn't given primarily so that you can cram your brain as if you were you know, preparing for a midterm exam. Your Proverbs isn't written primarily to be academic or, or to increase your IQ. Actually, Proverbs is written to mature you, to mature you in godly character and to develop loving competence for others. The Hebrew word here for wisdom could also be translated as skill or competence. What Solomon wants to give us is skill in living God's way in God's world. And that word instruction there isn't just you know, positive teaching, but it can also include discipline or correction. Wanting to show us the right way to go when we get off the path of wisdom. But notice the goal. The end of verse 3. So that we will learn how to live in righteousness, justice, and equity. Now, those have become popular words in our day, but we have to be very careful that we don't read our modern contemporary definitions back into the Bible. And so righteousness, you know, if, when we talk about somebody being righteous, we tend to think somebody being self-righteous, somebody who thinks, hey, I'm better than you are, I'm living this way, I'm holier than thou, but that's not at all what's intended here. Righteousness is something that's fixed, something that's straight. Think of a, a ruler or a yardstick. It it's, meets up to the norm and to the standard. 
In other words, righteousness is living in ways that align with the way that God created us to live. Justice isn't so much about everyone having equal personal rights or opportunities. Rather, justice is about life being made to align with God's righteous standard. And equity isn't about equal outcomes, as it's so often used today. But it's about conducting ourselves in ways that are honest and upright and fair, given a situation. So when it comes to yourself, then, it's about having godly character. When it comes to others, it's treating them with dignity and as responsible agents because they're created in the image of God. So we need to be a people of character. And Proverbs will will teach us how to have character in all of life, whether it be in sports or in school, or or whether it be at work or in family and relationships or within your community or within politics. But don't miss that, that the character here isn't being commanded. Rather, the character that's developed As a result, it's the fruit of receiving wisdom. And you don't receive wisdom, as it says, passively. You don't go home and try to use your Bible as a pillow and put, uh, you know, open up to the book of Proverbs, put it under your pillow and, you know, lay your head on it. You don't grow in wisdom by osmosis. No, the way you grow in wisdom is by seeking it learning it, being active and attentive, and then taking and applying it to your life. And why would you want wisdom? Because this is how to have the abundant life and the success that God would have for you. You It's football season once again. Chicago Bears start playing next Sunday. Hopefully this will be a better season for them. You know, to to play football, you've got to know the rules. But even if you know all the rules, even if you made no penalties in an entire year, you could still have a losing season. Because there's more to it than rules. There's also the strategy. There's a game plan that you need. Proverbs isn't going to give us rules. It's going to give us a game plan to live life God's way. And so Proverbs is written for us to learn to live God's way. But it's written as well to differing groups. Notice verse 4. It's to give prudence to the simple. Knowledge and discretion to the youth. In other words, it's for those who are just beginning in life. Those who who are young and inexperienced. We tend to use the word simple in a a rather negative way. When you hear simple, you might think of somebody who's a simple 10. Well, Proverbs can use the word simple to refer to somebody who's naive. But in this case, it's just saying somebody who is young. Somebody who's starting out. Somebody whose life is kind of like a, an open an open book. Somebody whose life is like a house with unfurnished rooms. The question is, what are you going to furnish the rooms with? With wisdom or with folly? So for those of you who are young among us, our you know, kids and youth, those of you even just starting out in your relationship with the Lord, Proverbs will teach you how to have prudence and knowledge and discretion. And the word prudence, you know, it's not talking about somebody being a prude, like a, a killjoy. Rather, this is actually the same word, the same root word that is used in Genesis 3 verse 1. Genesis 3 verse 1, it's used there to describe the serpent. We're told in Genesis 3, the serpent was more crafty, more prudent 
than any beast of the field. Obviously, that's using the word in the negative sense, but it can be used in a positive sense. Prudence is having shrewdness, craftiness, discernment, if you will, the, the very thing that Adam and Eve were lacking when they met the serpent. You know, we look at the world around us today, and isn't that exactly what's needed? Discernment and discretion. I mean, how many people, they turn on the TV. You know, you're watching TV or looking at social media or something. You're, you click on YouTube, and ads come up, and they're going to tell you all the things that you need to make your life exactly what you want it to be. All you have to do is buy their product. Do you know why advertisers do that? It's because there are a bunch of gullible people out there who actually do that. And I'm sure that we're among them at times. What do we need? We need prudence. We, we need discretion. You know, same thing when, when it comes to, to politicians or the media. So often, you know, even the fact checkers, they will spin the facts in their way to fit their agendas. What do we need? We need prudence. We need discernment, discretion. We need the wisdom that God gives us so that we don't fall into those self-destructive, toxic paths. So yes, Proverbs is given for beginners to start living wisely, but it's also given for those who are trained in wisdom, those who are experts, so to speak, in wise living. Verse 5 says, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. You know, age does not equal maturity and wisdom. And you've probably come across you know, folks who are older who you think, you should know better than that. I remember when I was a valet working at a restaurant in Louisville, Kentucky. I was parking cars and an elderly woman pulls up. She gets out of the car and she's really in a huff. And so I ask her, you know, what's going on? And she says, it's my birthday. I hate birthdays. I don't want to get older. And so I said to her, Oh, well, you know, with age comes wisdom. I don't know if I've ever been so wrong in my life. <laughs> she took great offense to what I said, and I have to admit, I feel bad for her unfortunate dinner party that night. No, even as you grow older, you need to remain teachable. Willing to ask questions and learn. As it says here, let the wise hear and increase. Grow in wisdom. Because that's what we see with Jesus. Luke 2 verse 52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And so it's the same for us as well. Part of the sanctification process of becoming more like Jesus is growing in wisdom just as Jesus did. So no matter your age, no matter your maturity, none of us have arrived. We can all continue to grow and increase in wisdom and in knowledge and living in God's ways. We need to be open to change because life is full of changes. No matter who you are, we can all continue to grow and become wiser. And it's the counsel, the guidance that we receive that helps us to continue to grow, to understand things, that gives us insight. It's like a light shining on, in a dark place. Proverbs is given to help us to continue to understand things more and more and more. Which brings us to the fourth purpose that Solomon gives. It's for all of us. The goal is that we would grow in wisdom and learn in community. As verse 6 says, 
this learning, this guidance is to understand a proverb and a saying. The words of the wise in their riddles. Why? Because they're not always clear. It takes time for us to grow in understanding. It takes effort for us and new experiences for us. To, and, and maybe you've had this happen where you're reading the Bible and you come across something and you think, I've read that a hundred times. I get it now. Sometimes it's that wisdom as we go through life that really God uses to help us to understand or to see how something applies to our own lives. You know, God created us to learn within community. We learn from others. Scientists are learning now that our human brains were created. They were made by God and wired to be social. And isn't that what we see in Genesis 2? It's not good for the man to be alone. We need others. We learn with and from others. And so Solomon would have us to sit in community with the wise who have gone before us. You see, we can learn from those who, though long dead, still speak words of life. And that is what we ought to do in the book of Proverbs. We must learn in community. And as a church, that's what we want to help you do. We've been announcing it. Now you know, fall's coming. We're restarting our men's group uh, on Tuesday nights. We're restarting our, our, our ladies' groups uh, on Wednesdays and Fridays. We're, we're restarting our community groups throughout the week. And if you're not involved, Get into one of our groups so that you can grow together in community with others. Take that step. I believe God will bless it in your life. Because in Solomon's day as in our day, Israel was facing the constant existential threat by the infiltration of pagan worldviews and ideas. See, paganism doesn't really appeal to the mind per se. No, paganism tends to appeal to your desires, to your selfish wants. Appeals to you to go after the things that you're hankering for. And so Israel needed wise teachers to guide them and to watch over them. You know, today we're facing really a new paganism called secularism. Secularism rejects God, rejects God's influence in the public square and says, yeah, you can be religious, but it then relegates religion to the private sphere. Well, secularism, of course, is based on a naturalistic worldview, and it leads to a moral relativism in which you know, either people decide for themselves what's right and wrong, or a group decides what's virtuous. Well, what ends up happening in secularism? Well, eventually, the, those virtues of the groups or the, those, well, what people consider right or wrong, they begin to conflict with one another. And so at the end of the day, secularism always leads to might making right. It will not lead to the way of wisdom. It cannot lead to the abundant life and human flourishing that God promises us. It is doomed to fail. So what's the way forward? How can you live wisely? How can you experience the abundant life that God has for you? Solomon tells us in verse 7. Shows us the path when he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is both the gateway into knowledge, but it's also the path on which you live wisely. And when it talks about knowledge here, this isn't, again, academic knowledge. It's not saying that you have to believe in God to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, there are plenty of intelligent unbelievers, just as there are pleasant, plenty of intelligent Christians. Instead, this is a knowledge 
It's found in living with God to understand why any of this even matters, how this all fits together to understand the big picture in life. And when he talks about the, the fear of the Lord, he's not saying merely that you'll be God-fearing, that you'll be more moralistic. Neither is this calling for a, a dread of God. Rather, the fear of the Lord is to live in awe of God, to recognize that God is God, and to reverently and humbly submit to him in love. The fear of the Lord is about living in right relationship with the God who is. Living with God as your covenant Lord. It is the beginning, but it is also the pathway of wisdom. You see, it's through the fear of the Lord that you see that God is holy and that you are a sinner. And that you see that you need God to save you. It's in the fear of the Lord that you look to God's word and you say, okay, God. How can I be saved? And it's God's word then, as 2 Timothy 3.15 says, that is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus came and promised us in John 10.10, 10, he said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, how can you have that abundant life, the eternal life that's found in relationship with God? It's only by coming to God through Jesus. By looking to Jesus who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to God. It's by putting your trust in Jesus, the risen Lord. That's where you begin. But it's also the path. As Colossians 2, 3 says, in Jesus Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's not coming to faith in Jesus plus getting wisdom. No, all wisdom is found in relationship with Jesus. So Paul can say in Colossians 2, verse 6, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in why? Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. How do you live? You live your life acknowledging Jesus is supreme. And as you live in relationship with him, your life begins to make sense and have an order to it. So maybe you're looking at your life and you don't yet know Jesus. Today, put your trust and your hope in him and him only. Begin on that path of wisdom by coming through Jesus, the door. Or maybe you're a Christian, you look at your life and things are out of sync at this point. Because so often what happens is we begin to live by our own wisdom. We begin to live life our own way and then we want God to bless us. If that's you this morning, confess your sin, the way that you've gotten off the path of wisdom, and instead turn back to Christ. So God is calling us to commit to the way of wisdom. Maybe it's a little surprising how verse 7 here ends. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I gotta admit, that's not the way that I probably would have ended this. But what Solomon is saying here is fools are fools because they leave God out. Or as Jay Adams says it, fools despise wisdom because they're fools, and they're fools because they despise wisdom. Fools reject God, and so they reject wisdom. But not only do they reject it, they despise it because wisdom goes completely contrary to the way they want to live. So Proverbs here concludes the introduction this way. Because Solomon is throwing down the gauntlet before you. He's calling you today to make a choice. Will you choose the way of wisdom? Or will you choose the way of folly? 
that will leave you in the end drowning in the river. Today, fear the Lord to receive and increase in wise living.